It's a pleasure to be here at this first meeting of the ISQG. The organizers have asked me to give a status report on causal set theory, and I will be joined by my colleagues Faye Dauker and Lisa Glasser on the 6th of October, next Wednesday, um, to discuss the same. Uh, the organizers gave us these few questions with which to frame our talks. Um, the first is what questions is causal set theory set out to solve? What have we answered fully or partially? How can these answers be tested? Is our universe cosmological evolution and particle content contained in it? So this is the outline of my talk. I will begin with a very brief review of the causal set hypothesis and frame those questions within a very natural division that happens for causal set theory, which is in terms of kinematics, dynamics, and phenomenology. Um, I will talk about the kinds of questions we want to have answers to uh, and where we have answers, where we have partial answers and where we have none. And I will end by looking at the set of things that we really are still looking for answers to. And hopefully that list will be supplemented on Wednesday by Lisa and Faye. So let me begin from the uh, motivation behind causal set theory. And the motivation is that associated with every Lorenzian spacetime, every causal Lorenzian spacetime is a causal structure per set. And uh, this is a partially ordered set. So per set stands for partially ordered set where this order relation, which is a causal ordering relation is acyclic and transitive. It is absent in any other signature. And this is important. Uh, we know that Riemannian geometries don't have uh, causal structures associated with them, but in any other spacetime, in any other signature spacetime, there is no causal structure per set. And so causal structure per sets are very much a signature of uh, this particular minus plus 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 signature that is Lorentzian spacetime. All of us know that under a conformal transformation, light cones don't change. In other words, the causal structure remains the same. So an important question to ask is suppose you have two uh, causal structure post sets, you know, coming from two different space times and they are the same, you find that they're the same causal structure post set then are the space times that they come from related by a conformal transformation? That's the reverse question. And the answer to that is in the affirmative. And this is this theorem due to Hawking, King, McCarthy, Malament, supplemented by a result by Kronheimer and Penrose, that if you have a causal space time, uh, which is, which have causal space times which are future and past distinguishing. And if there's a causal bijection between the causal structure post sets, then the space times are related by a conformal transformation. This gives you a new way of thinking of, or a different way of thinking about space time, which is in terms of the causal structure post set, which is basically everything, the conformal class is contained there. And the only missing ingredient is a local volume element. And so we think of space time as causal structure post set plus this local volume element. In four dimensions, for example, as Finkelstein uh, quipped, uh, the causal structure is uh, nine tenths of the metric because the volume element is just a scalar. So this is the starting point for causal set theory and the main motivation. Um, so we ask, well, instead of thinking about the metric and trying to quantize the metric, what about this causal structure per set, which is such an important part of Lorentzian geometry? Why not think of that as a starting point? And there's a long history of people who started to think in this direction um, listed below and culminated in a sense in the causal set hypothesis due to Bombelli, Lee, Meyer, and Sorkin. Some of those ideas were already present in Mirheim's CERN preprint, which got very ignored. But in this paper, the full hypothesis was laid out. So what is the hypothesis? It is that, okay, we start with the causal structure per set, but we need to add an extra ingredient to get out the 
volume element. And instead of doing adding something in, we actually say, well, what we have, if we think of it as a discrete object, a discrete object, then it naturally comes with its own volume element. And what, what do we mean by discreteness? We mean that we want to be able to say that for a finite space-time volume, in other words, finite, finite Alexander of interval between these two events, you have a finite number of space-time atoms or space-time elements. That's the kind of fundamental discreteness you want. And you say, so well, it's all there once you've discretized the object the causal structure per set, you also get for free, so to speak, the volume element. So a causal set by definition is a locally finite per set. So it is acyclic, transitive, but also satisfies this condition of local finiteness, which is that local space-time regions or local regions in the causal set, intervals, Alexander of intervals, have only a finite number of elements between them. Um, so we think then of the continuum as an approximation, um, not in as a continuum limit. We don't look at continuum limits, although we do in some special cases, because of course we'd like to match with the continuum in certain cases, but fundamentally it's only a, an approximation. And so the idea is then to take order and this volume, this causal structure, causal ordering and the volume, which is there in the continuum and replace it by the discrete object, which is order, and number, and it approximates spacetime. The idea is that it would approximate spacetime. So the hypothesis is as follows: that the fundamental objects that we that are in quantum gravity are, are causal sets, and these are just locally finite, partially ordered sets. And if we stop there, of course, we would have some theory of locally finite, partially ordered sets. But we do want to make a connection with Lorentzian geometry. So in order to do that, we have to have a continuum approximation. We have to go back to Hawking Malaman theorem, Hawking King McCarthy Malaman Penrose uh, theorem and say, well, we want to make this correspondence very clear. So one way to do it is then the, the, the way to do it is to say order corresponds to causal structure and number to the spacetime volume. Now, if we did this with a regular lattice, uh, we could get uh, the order from the causal structure, but this number to volume correspondence is very difficult to get. It's impossible to get because we want that to make sense in any frame. It should not be a frame dependent statement. So in causal set theory, we posit that the continuum approximation is done via a uh, Poisson sprinkling by a random discretization, uh, where V is the space-time volume. It's, it's a uniform distribution with respect to the space-time volume. Um, and on an average, the number of elements is proportional to the volume. So you get the number to volume correspondence on average. So what are the questions that this bare bones approach to quantum gravity is set out to solve. Like I said, there are three ways in which you can divide the theory, natural ways. One is kinematics, one is dynamics, and one is phenomenology. Um, in kinematics, we ask, is this discretization compatible with Lorentz invariance? Does the causal set capture all the relevant information of the continuum? And does it provide UV completeness for QFT? In dynamics, we want to ask, is there a non perturbative quantum theory of causal sets? What are the observables of the theory? Um, this is, of course, with, these are very, very important questions for quantum gravity. And um, so I will present some of the things that we do understand, but mostly things that we don't yet have answers to. And phenomenology can causal set theory be tested? Is it compatible with cosmology and particle quantum? And in some sense, it is, in fact, very compatible with things that are known about the current universe. So let me begin with uh, the first question, is causal set theory discretization compatible with Lorentz invariance? And the answer is yes. Um, this is a result due to Bombelli, Henson, and Sorkin, where they basically said, well, let's look at the space of all sprinklings into uh, Minkowski spacetime. That's the ensemble of sprinklings, the, this Poisson ensemble. And we need to have a Lorentz invariant measure that takes the space of sprinklings 
into, you know, it's a measure takes into the real line. And now let's look at this set of unit time life directions, say the future directed. So one of the green, the top green hyperbola here. And that's a set of unit directions. And that's the invariant hyperbole that we are so used to in special relativity. And so the question is, in any given sprinkling, if I chose a direction, if I can I choose a direction uh, which then has to transform in the right way? And the answer to that is no. And it essentially comes from the fact that what you have, unlike in Riemannian space, where you would have the sphere of directions as a red ball there, which is compact, here the sphere of the, you don't you have the hyperbole of directions, which is non-compact. And so the answer to this is a clear, yes, it is compatible. Some would say it's also a prediction of the theory. Um, the second is, does the causal set capture all the relevant information in the continuum? And this is an important question because what we have done is we've thrown away the continuum. We've only got a substructure that's remaining and we want to know whether there's enough information there. And it has to be relevant in a specific sense, which will become clear later. Um, and so here, rho is finite, but there's also a, a feature of this uh, random geometry, which is non-locality. And essentially what you get are graphs with fixed valency, without a fixed valency, sorry. So uh, if you have Minkowski space-time, the number of nearest neighbors is infinite. So we have to deal with structures of this sort. So a lot of the mathematics that one deals with in discrete theories, which then relate to the continuum is not available. And the third thing is that the ensemble itself is kinematic. So there's no quantum, you know, no quantum dynamics going on, no H bar sitting here, but we still have a probabilistic structure, which comes from this Poisson sprinkling. And so what we're interested in is a geometric reconstruction, starting with the discrete structure, where in this order, ordering of things is geometry hidden. And that's our way of rephrasing the question. And so the answer is that there are many geometric and topological invariants we have from order. Um, here's a list of them, possibly not complete, but hopefully uh, many of them are on this list. And just to give you a flavor of it, um, if you consider the time-like distance uh, in Minkowski space-time, uh, Brightwell and Gregory showed very long time ago that uh, between uh, the two events here and here, um, you can construct the set of all possible chains between them. And a chain is a total order. So you basically have all the elements in it are related to each other. So you look at all the possible chains and you, you look for the one that's the longest in terms of the number of elements that lie between them. And it turns out that the proper time is proportional to the length of the longest chain, which is exactly what you would imagine in Lorentzian space-time. Uh, second is a dimension estimator due to Milham and Meyer, where again in some region like this, again in Minkowski space-time, you count the number of relations that are there, just the number of elements that are related to each other. How many relations are there in this causal set, in the sub-causal set? And you, you know, look at the ordering fraction, which is with respect to the number of possible relations that can be there, which is just uh, D choose two. And that object is a dimension dependent constant. A very important uh, development that happened in the uh, 2010 to 2013 was that there was a, a proposal for a discrete Einstein-Hilbert action, which of course has made a very big difference to the field. Uh, and this is the benincasa dauker glasser actions and here's just one of them in four dimensions. And the objects that you see, N0, N1, N2, N3, are the number of Alexandrov intervals of a given size, of a given discrete size, okay? So this is just, you know, I've just illustrated it here. And N is the total number of elements. So you look at a finite region and a finite causal set, and you define the benin kasser dauker glasser action from it. And in the limit, of uh, infinite density, you find that it does approximate to the Einstein-Hilbert action along with some boundary terms, which I will not have time to talk about today. Um, we can also look at spatial topology and geometry. Um, this is a harder question because 
one thing to understand is that although in causal sets you can construct something that looks like the Cauchy hypersurface, and that's just a set of unrelated elements, but they're maximal in the sense that anything that doesn't belong to that set is either to its future or to its past. But nevertheless, this isn't a good enough Cauchy hypersurface. In fact, it's something called a we call a Cauchy sieve, where it doesn't capture all the relations because of the discreteness and the non-locality. That's really the key. It doesn't capture all the relations. So there's a lot of information in terms of the relational information that goes missing. So the way in which you can reconstruct information is by actually borrowing information from a color neighborhood and reconstructing information. And so one has recovered homology, spatial distance, spatial volume, and uh, more recently, the Gibbons Hawking York term in the action from, from this. So, um, so important to all of this is that uh, partial on, on answer is that the causal set contains a lot of information about the space time. So, all of these topological and geometric invariants. But a question that is really at the back of all of this is how unique is a causal set containing correspondence? And this is what we call the fun fundamental conjecture. In other words, if a causal set comes from or is approximated by two different manifolds, then they must be in some uh, way close to each other. Uh, they must be close on scales that are of, at and lower than the discreteness scales. So uh, here's just a very quick uh, thing to say that um, there's a partial answer again that it's true for a set of ge geometric and topological invariants, but we are not yet there. We don't yet have a full proof. Does it provide UV completeness for QFT? Um, and the answer to this comes from a constructing, construction due to uh, Johnston and Sorkin. Uh, first, Johnston constructed, had this idea of how to do quantum fields on curves, on uh, causal sets, sorry. And um, he did this via the green function. He first constructed green functions and then defined the Sorkin Johnson, what was now called the Sorkin Johnson vacuum, by using the Pauli Jordan operator. So he used the Pyles bracket and used the Pauli Jordan operator and realized that it's actually a Hermitian operator in a particular in this, and to use that spectrum to define the um, volume, or uh, uh, define, sorry, the vacuum of. Uh, on the causal set. This, of course, is for a scalar field, um, free scalar field theory. And uh, is it a covariant uh, regulator? And the answer to that is yes, that if you look and you compare the spectrum of that comes from this, um, from, this, this, from this kind of way of defining the vacuum, then the spectrum is in fact cut off in this way that you get this me, and so you have a finite spectrum. So the partial answer is that, yes, there is a UV finite covariant spectrum that you get out of the theory. Um, a way to test this is also through entanglement entropy. The, that uh, also leads to interesting puzzles. But again, because of the fact that you have a finite spectrum, you do get a finite answer. You don't get the area dependence, but you get a volume dependence. You only get the area dependence when you uh, remove these things that don't have continuum counterparts. And so there are interesting ideas, interesting open questions in this uh, approach, um, more questions. There's also um, an approach to QFT on causal sets by using a preferred pass uh, due to the following authors, which I won't have any time to talk about. Question, of course, is, is there a non perturbative quantum theory of causal sets? And there are two very different approaches. One is using the uh, path integral, the, the partition function, and the other is a fundamentally different way of growing causal sets element by element. Uh, in the first case, we have two ways to look at the problem. One is that we notice the following, that there's an entropy versus action problem. In other words, if you look at the space of all possible n element causal sets, it's dominated by objects that are completely non-manifold like, like this three layer poset, which is called a Kleitman Rothschild poset. So the question is, is there any chance for manifold like causal sets to emerge out of this theory? And there are again, partial results that the link action trumps the KR, these kinds of ones, as well as the bilayer posets. 
Um, and so this is a version of the Ben and Casa de Alper action. There are also state sum models which uh, have very many interesting features where we can calculate a phase transition which occurs fairly ubiquitous, fairly ubiquitously when you um, when you constrain the sample space. Finally, there's the sequential growth models, which are, uh, of course, the more fundamental way of thinking about causal sets. And this was uh, first fleshed out by Rydart and Sorkin in the classical case. Uh, these are classical sequential growth models where an element is grown, where, where the, you know, the causal set universe is grown element by element in a probabilistic way, in the classical case, a probabilistic stochastic way. And uh, the new element comes to either is unrelated or is uh, comes to its to the future of an existing element. And so there's a sort of causality built into this. Of course, there's some recent, very interesting work by Faye and Stav, which I hope they will, she will tell us a little bit about. But one of the important things is that in this, we have a definition of covariant observables, and uh, we have toy models for quantum sequential growth. Um, so there's a well-defined paradigm. So here are the partial answers, well-defined paradigm, classical models for cl dynamics are well understood, toy model for covariant quantum dynamics. Um, the question that we want to also ask is what are the covariant observables of the theory? And for finite causal sets, there were the entire set that we had earlier, which are all these ordered invariants, action, dimension, et cetera. All of them are covariantly defined. They're, don't depend on the labeling in the causal set, which is sort of a, in lieu of covariance in the discrete setting. And for countable causal sets in the sequential growth, these are events in an event algebra, which is generated by the growth. And these are covariant events. You want to make sure that they're label free, they're label independent, and a special class of them are stem events. And here are examples of those various events. And so the answer here is actually more I think more clearer in some sense, which is that all order invariant questions are um, observables of the theory. And I think we're much clearer on this than perhaps other things. So the next question is, can CST be tested? Is it predictive? Um, is it compatible with cosmology? And particle content of the universe, unfortunately I've scratched that out because it isn't. And the answer to the others is that yes, I mean, Yes, again, it should be a partial answer, but in some ways there are some very strong results and predictions. Uh, first is, of course, Lorentz invariance, which we already saw, and it's a good thing that uh, all everyone sort of has come to a consensus that I think that Lorentz invariance is, uh, is a really good and tight symmetry of nature. Um, Non-locality is something that, as I said, comes out of causal sets. And there's some very interesting work that uh, the following authors have done in trying to understand how to test non-locality using these optometric uh, oscillators. So I think that that's something that is very much, uh, you know, one would look forward to seeing whether those things can be tested and whether causal sets can be tested the specific non-locality causal sets can be tested. And then we have swerves, which is diffusion in momentum space because of the fact that we have a fundamental discreteness. You can think of the equivalent of Brownian motion where a particle is jumping around, hopping around on a causal set. There's no straight path. So it has to kind of kick itself around like that. And so these little kicks are like are momentum kicks. And this was this uh, work of Dauka, Henson and Sorkin and subsequent other work and also discussed by Califor and Mattingly. And uh, the idea is that because of a momentum space diffusion, you can get a tail in the, in the energy spectrum, which is a high energy events, which are rare, but possible because of the very old age of the universe. And of course, the most important is a prediction of a lambda by Raphael Sorkin, um, where, which comes from an extremely simple argument, but as you can see, it comes from um, the use of the Poisson distribution and using that you get the fact that lambda is ever present. Um, there's also some amazing work on varying lambda, which I will not have any time to cover, but which basically looks at these varying lambda models coming from causal sets and comparing them with lambda, CM, uh, lambda CMB 
And the suggestion is that they do as well as on the CMB. So I'm going to end with these um, questions on the slide. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your attention.